I want to begin uh, with a question this morning that I have a feeling I already know the answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you ever done something really, really dumb? All right. All right. So here's the good news. All right. The good news is that we are all in the same boat, right? We, we all can identify with something, and, and maybe it's more recent for some of you than others, but all of us can identify uh, with a time that we did something really, really dumb, something really, really foolish. And we could probably all tell stories, not only of our own foolishness, but of the foolishness of people around us. As we continue our journey with uh, Paul, as he's writing to the letter, this letter of Galatians to the Galatian believers, uh, we're going to be in chapter, chapter 3 today uh, and work through some of chapter 3. So you have your Bible, I invite you to turn there. And just uh, as we begin to remind ourselves, these believers were people that Paul had met. He had helped plant and establish these churches, and he had watched them put their faith in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And he watched the gospel save them and transform them. But as he wrote this letter, he had heard reports that false teachers had come into the church and were leading them away from a simple trust in the gospel. In fact, they were telling them that they had to go back and add the law in as well, that they had to follow all the laws of, of, of Moses in order to become a Christian. And for Paul, he knew that this absolutely was not true. And you remember, he was passionate about this. You know, Paul was a passionate guy, but he was really, really passionate about this because it was so personal to him. And we're going to see that passion. And so Paul, in this chapter, is going to call them their attention to their foolishness. He's going to awaken their minds to the foolishness that they are being drawn towards. And listen, nobody wants to be called a fool, right? I mean, nobody says, I want to be foolish. And Paul realized that, that these believers, they, they didn't wake up in the morning and intend to be foolish. And even the word that we're going to see Paul uses for fool shows that he knew that they had the capacity, they had the intelligence, the spiritual awareness to know the truth. But they were being drawn away. And so Paul wants to pull them back from this danger. Now, as we think about that, we realize that, that we too, in our generation, like every generation of followers of Christ, may have the same tendency to drift away from the gospel. Now, it could be to law. It could be to, I have to be, uh, have faith in Christ, but I have to keep the rules. I have to obey in order to earn God's love or favor or, or be in good standing with him and we don't have to do that. We obey because we love God and His Spirit lives in us. But it also could be a tendency to drift away from the gospel because the gospel offends. right? The gospel offends a culture that says that there should be many ways to God. Truth is whatever I believe truth to be. And for you to say that there's only one way to God, that's, that's bigoted, that's narrow-minded, that's, that's not right. And, and so we live in a world where there could be tendencies for us to drift away from the truth of the gospel because of the consequences that it might cost us. Or maybe it's because we have doubts or questions. And it's okay to have doubts and questions. And Paul knew that it was hard to live out your faith. For Paul, it personally cost him many times. And so he knows it's hard. He knows it's difficult. But here's what Paul knew. Paul knew who he was, and he knew whose he was. Paul knew who he was and whose he was. All right? And so because Paul knew his identity, because Paul knew who he was and who he belonged to, right, he was able to cling to the truth of the gospel and to stay steadfast and true to it, not by his own strength, but by the power of the Spirit. And he was able to do that because he knew he belonged to God. And he knew that that was all that really mattered. You know, identity is something that that we all wrestle with and deal with, isn't it? Right? And we all long for and we all want an identity. And as we're growing up, we, we're trying to figure out what, where, how do I, what is my identity? What defines me? What makes me me? And our culture and our world will tell you lots of things about where you should find your identity or what gives you identity. But we're going to see in this chapter today that Paul found that real and true identity was found in the gospel. That first of all, our identity is found in the fact that we are image bearers of God as human beings. We talked a little bit about that on Monday. 
But then, specifically, for those of us that have come to Christ, that we've come to faith in Christ, we've come to the gospel, that our identity is now found in Christ. And Paul's going to even talk about how we are clothed with Christ. And that we find our identity in Him. You know, when I came here uh, as a student, I was struggling to understand or know my identity. And I didn't even realize that I was. It, it wasn't that I would wake up in the morning and wonder about my identity or think about that. But I struggled with who, who was I? And how was I going to live? And, and it was here as a student that I saw other students who loved Jesus, who were seeking to live out their faith and walk with Christ, that I realized that's who I am. That's my identity, but I wasn't living it out because my understanding of who I was wasn't developed enough. My, my understanding of the community around me wasn't developed enough. And my understanding of my inheritance in Christ wasn't fully developed. And so I want us to look at those things today as we dive into Galatians. And I'm praying for you that what God did for me, he will do for you, especially if you're struggling in these areas. So let's, let's begin Galatians chapter 3, and we'll start with the first three verses. Paul says, you foolish Galatians. Now, how many of you would imagine is if you were in a gathering of believers and, and you were hearing this letter read, because that's how they would have experienced this text for the first time, you know, that, you know, I'm sure that they sent out you know, a text message and an email to everyone that week saying, hey, don't, don't miss church this week. We've got a letter from Paul. We're going to be reading Paul's letter. Right? We're going to have a potluck afterwards. Are you with me? Right? right? This is going to be a big Sunday. Don't miss it out. And, and so they gather around. And of course, we already know from our, our journey so far that, that Paul didn't really give them a very warm greeting. He didn't, he didn't uh, jump in with kindness or niceness. But he, well, he was kind, but it, it, was, it was direct. Does that make sense? And he just jumps in and to the issues at hand. And now, as they're hearing this letter, he says, you foolish Galatians. And how many of you would think that would have got my attention? All right. If somebody calls you fool, a fool or foolish, it gets your attention. And again, the word, that, the word that Paul here uses is not someone who is unable or lacks the mental capacity to know something. He's not talking about someone that's just dumb. Right? He says... It, he uses a word to describe someone that should know or has the capacity to know, but has moved away from that. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you or who has cast a spell on you? Or your translation may even say, who has bewitched you? And so in this culture, in this day, there, there was a belief that, that spells could be cast on people and that one of the ways that you could do that is through an evil eye, right? And so if somebody gave you an evil eye, right? Has anyone ever given you an evil eye? Right? Your parents, teachers, somebody. But they thought that that was a way that, that a spell could be cast. And so Paul uses what they would have been familiar with. And he says, he says, who's cast a spell on you? Right? It seems like you're under a spell. You're under darkness. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified. He said, I preached the gospel to you. You heard about Jesus. You heard about his life, his death. He says, I... I only want to learn this from you. I, I need to know something. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul asked them a rhetorical question, right? He says, I, I, I want you to think about this for a minute. He says, when you came to know Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live within you. And this is an important thing for Paul, right? Because Paul knew that the, the, the secret to the Christian life was that Christ lived in us now through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in us and He gives us power. He gives us strength. Right? The Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and to me. And that the life He calls us to live, He calls us to live in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And He says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by keeping the rules, by following the law of Moses, or by hearing with faith? And he knew the answer to that, and he wanted them to remember. You know, sometimes, sometimes we have to go back. Sometimes we have to go back to those places where God worked in our life. You know, as my, in my journey with Christ, I've had struggles. I've had doubts. I've had questions. And one of the things that has always helped me sometimes is to go back to that place where God revealed himself so clearly, so powerfully, in such a real way, in such a vivid way. And it's those, those moments that I remember what is true. Because my feelings and my emotions and my mind 
They can play tricks on you. Anybody ever experienced that? Right? And so Paul brings them back and he says, Are you so foolish, verse 3, after beginning with the Spirit, that you're now going to be made complete by the flesh? He says, Christ lives within you. It's not about fulfilling. Jesus fulfilled the law. And he paid the penalty, the price that we deserve for being lawbreakers. And he, he offers you grace, and he offers you his spirit, and he offers you his power. Why would you go back? Right? Why would you go back to that? It's like, you know, I, I, he just for Paul, it just, it's so crazy. Because grace is so much better than the law. Right? And the law wasn't bad. The law was from God. The law was good. Jesus fulfilled the law. But grace is so much better than the law. But it does offend us, right? Because grace says that we have a problem that we cannot fix. Grace says we have a need that we ourselves are unable to meet. We have a bill that we have no capacity to pay. And it, grace reminds us that we are sinful people. Grace reminds us that there is real judgment. Because in order for us to receive grace, right, something that we don't deserve, right? We, we are in grace given something that we did not earn, did not deserve, could not have in any other way than it was given to us. And so grace reminds us that we have a problem, that sin is a problem, and sin brings judgment. And we don't like judgment, right? And maybe you've heard someone say, you can't judge me, or don't judge me. Or maybe you said something like that, but here's the thing. As human beings who have sinned against a holy God, we are already under judgment. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 35 and 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. But the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on Him. And so we are already judged. We're already condemned. Earlier in John chapter 3, Jesus said the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. But he came, what? To save us and to rescue us and to give us grace. Paul goes on in, in verse 4. He said, did you suffer so much for nothing? If in fact it was for nothing. So then does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And so Paul continues with the rhetorical questions. He, he wants them to remember. He wants them to think. And he says, he says you received the Spirit. How, how did that happen? You've seen miracles. You've seen the power of God at work in you and in your community. And he said, how did that happen? Did it come by works of the law or by the hearing with faith? And then he goes on and he's going to give them the illustration of Abraham. And these were, again, these were believers that had come out of Jewish background. And so Abraham was extremely important for them. He's the father of their faith in, in the human speaking. And so he says in verse 6, Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness, so understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and foretold the good news to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you, so that those who have faith are blessed with Abraham, who had faith. And so Paul reminds them, he says, This all began with faith, right? Abraham, whom God reveals himself to. Remember, God speaks to Abram, and he calls him out to leave his land, to leave his family, and to go to a place that God's going to show him, and he makes him these incredible promises about what he's going to do for him. But the ultimate promise... In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is that God was going to bless the world through Abraham. And we know now, looking back, that the way that God was going to bless the world through Abraham was through Jesus. Right? That it would be through Abraham and his lineage that God would bring his salvation into the world. And so Paul wants to remind these believers, he says, it all began with faith. Abraham was justified not by the law, but by faith. And he had faith. And he says, God has always intended that it would be by faith. And he's always planned to include the Gentiles. That we would all become one family in God through Jesus Christ. Verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law. But the righteous will live by faith. 
But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. And so, just briefly for the sake of time, Paul is Paul's reminding them that the law points to our sinfulness. And that there's no human being who's perfectly kept God's law. And in that way, he says the law brings a curse. Right? Because the law points out our sin. The law points out where we have fallen short. Right? Paul said that in Romans that we've all fallen short right, of the glory of God. And so the law leaves us guilty. And he says only the one who could completely keep the law would be able to be justified by the law. And no one could do that. But notice verse 13. And as Paul brings it back to the gospel, he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Right? He says, Christ came and he redeemed us. He bought us out of the bondage of sin, the bondage of death. And it says he himself became the curse for us. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy. He says, he says cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Right? And, and this was an Old Testament reference, not precisely to crucifixion, but the fact that there were times when someone was executed, if their crimes were very horrendous, that they would hang their body out in shame. And this was considered to be very horrific for a Jewish person. It was the last thing that you wanted to happen to you. And it says of Jesus that he became the curse. He did hang on a tree. He hung on a cross for you and for me and for the whole world, for Jew and for Gentile. He bore the weight and the cost of our sin. He absorbed the righteous wrath of God that we deserved. And he died in our place. And Paul says the purpose of this was that so the blessing of Abraham would come to Jew and to Gentile in Christ, and that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so for Paul, he says, how could we dare go back to the, to the law when Christ has fulfilled the law, and he died for us, and he bore the curse of the law for us? Why would we go back? Grace is better. The Spirit is better. And for us, he might say, why would we drift away to worldly philosophies? Why would we drift away from the truth of the gospel, when Jesus Christ bore the weight of your sin and your guilt, that he died for you, that he rose from the dead, he's given you his spirit. And, and so for Paul, the issue wasn't that the law was bad, but that the law wasn't able to save. And now Christ had made that way. Jump down to verse 22. Um, and we can't get through all this chapter this morning, so I, I want to get to ch chapter 22. It says, but the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith was revealed. The law, then, was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. Right, so for Paul, he's very clear, right, that the law brought imprisonment. The law left us guilty. The law wasn't bad. He said it was a schoolmaster. It was our guardian. It brought us to Christ. And we are justified, what? By, everybody say it with me. Faith. We are justified by faith, by believing. Look at verse 25. He says, but since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so now he's going to get to our identity. Right? Notice he says that, that since faith has come, we're not under the law. He says you become sons of God. You become children of God. And tomorrow we're going to get into the subject of adoption and the beautiful picture of what God has done for us through, through Christ. But, but for today, just know that it is not an insignificant thing for you to understand yourself as a child of God. I know we've all heard that. We've all heard that a thousand times. And sometimes what is familiar to us loses its significance. But it is not an insignificant thing to you understand that I'm a child of God. I became a child of God when I placed my faith in Christ, when he revealed himself to me through his mercy and his grace 
when he brought me to a place where I saw him for who he was, when I saw my sin for what it was, and I believed that Christ died for me, that he rose from the dead, that, that he is able to say, when that happened, I became a child of God. Look at verse 27. He said, I've been baptized or immersed into Christ. And so I am spiritually in Christ. He's in me and I'm in him. And he says, I have now put on Christ. Right? And so my identity now is that I am a child of God. That's who I am. Right? It's not about my hair color, which is getting increasingly gray. Right? It's not about my athletic ability, which was never very much at all. It's not about my musical talent, which was never as good as most of yours. Right? It's, not about, it's not about whether I was popular or not popular. It's about who Christ is. Right? That's what, it's not whether I am white or black or Asian. It's not whether I'm male or female. We're, we're going to get to that. My identity, what most matters, is that I am a child of God. That's who I am. And when you understand who you are and whose you are, it will give you the ability to live out your faith in a world that's very, very difficult. We all want identity. We all want to belong. And your identity is found in Christ. Right? We have become God's children. A recipient of his love, of his grace of his mercy, of his goodness, right? And that's why Paul would say, that's why we looked at yesterday, I've been crucified with Christ, right? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave me myself for me. That was Paul's identity now. But not only his identity, but look at his community. Look at verse 28. He says, and, and this is relating to salvation. He says, there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what Paul wasn't saying was that these things didn't exist. Of course there were people who were Jewish. And of course there were Gentiles. And there were slaves and there were free. And that was mainly in Paul's culture an economic reality, a social reality, that there were people who were poor and had to put themselves into slavery in order to pay off their debts or to survive. And there were people that were really wealthy. And there were males and female. And, and there were gender issues in that age. And women were treated badly in, at lots of times in history. And Paul says... But in Christ, in the gospel, he says, these things don't matter. Right? He's not saying they don't exist. But he says they don't matter because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And everyone becomes equally a child of God. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor. It doesn't matter. You are accepted, valued, loved in Christ. And you now have a community. Right? You now have a community around you. Right? And, and so it's so important. God didn't call us to live out our faith alone. Right? He called us to live out our faith in community. And the community of God is amazing. Now, the community of God can also be difficult because we're people and we're not perfect yet. And sometimes we hurt each other. Right? And maybe you've experienced church hurt and you've experienced hurt in the community of faith. I have. I've been there. And I know how painful that is. But I also know that just because there was some hurt and some that acted in ungodly ways, does not mean that the community of Christ isn't valuable. When I came to Chehi 27 years ago, I found this incredible community. And one of the things that I love is that now, so many years later, I still find that. And I hope you found that. And, and we need that. And we have that because of Christ. We all come from different places. We come from different streams of, Christ, of, of Christian faith and as far as doctrine or denomination. But, but he says we are one in Christ. Right? And and Christ is what matters. And so we have this family, this community that we belong to. And then verse 29, he says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Not only do you have identity and community, but you have an inheritance. And Paul would want you to know, he wanted the believers there to know that, that this life and this age is not all that there is. This life and this age is not all that there is. He says, you are Abra if, you, if you are Christ. You're Abraham's seed and you're heirs. You're heirs of an inheritance according to the promise. And the inheritance that you have is the very kingdom of God. The rule and reign of God that he's invited you to belong to, to be part of now and for all of eternity. One of my favorite verses is found in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. It's something that Jesus said, and God has used this verse powerfully in my life. And Jesus said this, he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, or fear not, little flock. For it's the Father's good pleasure, where the Father delights to give you his kingdom. Right? In, in some difficult moments in my life where I was struggling and I was uncertain, 
that truth just enabled me to understand the depth of God's love for me. He says, fear not, little flock. What? It's the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. This is Abraham that Paul referenced here in Galatians. He said he lived by faith, and he left his life that he had been living. Abraham was a wealthy man with much means, and yet it said he left and he followed God. He lived in tents. Why? Because he knew that this age wasn't all that there is. And he was looking forward to the inheritance that God had promised. And so as we wrap up today, my, my challenge to you would be this. Don't be foolish. Now, we've all done dumb things. And here's the bad news. I'm pretty sure all of us are going to do some more dumb things in our life. Wouldn't it be great if we could all just decide that we would never do anything dumb again? How many of you would like that? Like, wouldn't that be awesome Like, if we could all just agree, like, never again will I do anything dumb? And how many of you have ever said, I'll never be this foolish again, but you were, right? All right. Thank you, Sean. All right. <laughs> Looks like it was just me and Sean. But here's the thing. When it comes to faith, right, we don't have to be foolish. There's nothing better than the gospel. Right? Here's the thing. You know, I, there are better speakers, there are better preachers, but no one can preach a better gospel than I can. And the reason is there's only one. There's only one gospel. And that gospel is this, is that God loves you. He created this world. And even though you rebelled against him, he sent his son, who lived for you, who died for you, and who rose from the dead. And he, and he alone can save. Colossians 2 8 says, Be careful. How many of you ever had a parent that told you to be careful? All right. That means they love you, right? They want you to be safe. They, they don't want you to be hurt. Paul says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world, and not based on Christ. There will always be temptations to pull away from the gospel to hear this or that or all these things, but there's something that you can know is true, and the gospel is true. And so in Christ, we find our true identity, we find our true community, and we find our true inheritance. Listen, we all struggle with this. We struggle. I struggle. But I want you to know what's true. And I don't want you to be foolish. But I, I want you to discover and know the beauty and the power of the grace of God and let it transform you, to let it give you identity, to find your community in the family of faith, and to find hope in the inheritance that you have in Christ, so that you will be able to live for him, and to fulfill the purpose that God has made for you. Every one of you have a purpose. Right? God, God, God created you on purpose, he saved you on purpose, and he's given you a life of purpose. And I want to see all of you know and live for that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for... Uh, this day that you've given us. Father, I thank you for waking us up, for putting breath in our lungs. Father, for, for giving us strength to, to uh, embrace a new day. I thank you for your word that's true and living and powerful. And I pray this morning that, that your word would imprint on our hearts and on our minds, that the truth of your word would, would, would surround us, that it would strengthen us. And Father, I pray that everyone here today would, would just know how much you love them, I pray that they would discover and know their identity as a follower of Christ, as someone who's received the Spirit of God and become a child of God. I pray that they would know the beauty of their community and the hope of their inheritance. And Father, I pray that, that knowing those things, that we would cling tightly to the truth, that nothing would take us away from the gospel, that we wouldn't fall prey to empty philosophies of this world, but that we would cling tightly to the truth of the gospel and that we would experience the goodness of your grace in our lives, and that we would live for your glory and your purposes. And we ask this in Jesus' name.